This is Season 1, Episode 30, and you are listening to an After Dinner Conversation magazine podcast. After Dinner Conversation believes humanity is improved by ethics and morals grounded in philosophical truth, and that truth is discovered through intentional reflection and respectful debate. In order to facilitate this process, we've created a growing series of print books, a monthly short story magazine, and two different podcasts. This podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Audiobooks, provides audiobook readings of stories that have appeared in our magazine, and our companion podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Discussions, is where we discuss the ethics of the choices made in the stories as a way to model the kinds of discussions we hope you're having about these readings with friends, family, or students. We would love it if you would go over and check it out as well. In fact, we discuss the ethics and decisions made in this very story in our companion podcast, After Dinner Conversation Discussions, in episode 52. So when you're all done listening to this audio podcast, head over to our companion podcast and listen to our discussion of this story. We'll include a link in the description. And of course, you can always continue the discussion on our webpage, in the comments section, or on our Facebook page. I'm Colby, your narrator and the creator of After Dinner Conversation Publishing. Thank you for spending your time listening to our podcast and for reading the magazine. Thank you for supporting us through your magazine subscriptions and through patreon.com forward slash after dinner conversation. And of course, if you enjoy this audio book reading, please subscribe to our podcast, share it on social media and suggested to friends. Today's story is by James A. Hartley, and it is in our May 2021 magazine. The title of it is Guilt Edge Security. I sat beside the bar, rubbing my glass across polished mahogany and watching trails of moisture it left behind. It must have cost them a fortune to ship real wood way out to the rim. It didn't look synthetic. I looked over at the barman and he tossed his head, then went back to polishing the glasses. Real authentic stuff. I was nursing my fourth bourbon when the guy walked in. He was a florid, heavy-set guy, and I could just tell he was a salesman. He had the suit, he had the haircut, and he had the little case. Maybe things would have been different if it had been a different night. He swaggered up to the bar and planted himself like he owned the place. Maybe he did. He raised two fingers and the barman filled a glass with what looked like scotch. He drained the first one quickly, then signaled for another. When his second arrived, he turned to scan the bar. I studied him out of the corner of my eye. Finally, he turned and looked at me, nodded and smiled. Another quick circuit of the room, and he slid his drink down the bar toward me. Hey, Mac, he said to me. Mind if I join you? I shrugged and motioned to the place beside me. Looking back, that might have been the big mistake. You're in the game, right, he said. You look the sort, marketing and sales, right? No other reason for being out in this backwater. Let me guess, you're from Earth. I nodded and he grinned. Yeah, me too, Jack. Jack Davis is the name. He thrust a meaty paw toward me, and I shook it. Steve Walker, I said. So what are you drinking, Steve, he said. I pointed at my bourbon, and he motioned to the barman and pointed to both our glasses. I didn't mind. If this Jack Davis was going to buy me drinks, I could put up with a pitch. I guessed that that's what was coming. If I listened, he'd probably buy me drinks all night. I wouldn't have to sign anything, and I'd walk away at the end several bourbons better off. Well, Steve, it's lucky I ran across you. You and me being in the same game, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Let me ask you a question, Steve. What do you think about integrity? It was a funny sort of question. How do you mean? Well, you know, you and me both were in sales. Is integrity a part of that? I still don't... Okay, Maybe I need to make it a bit clearer. You ever heard of a place called Galapienzo? 
I pressed my lips together and shook my head. He nodded. Yeah, well, neither had I. Then I sort of bumped into the place. You know how it is. I nodded my head in humor and glanced significantly at my glass. He grinned and waved the barman over. The way I got involved was pretty simple, he said. I'd been doing the rim, selling a line of high-tech components to the emerging markets. Some of those rim worlds had a lot of promise at the time. The returns were meager, but you have to have vision in this game. Am I right? I nodded and looked attentive. The bourbon was good. You sell them a bit of tech, they build on that. Then they start wanting bigger and better things. It was a good market, or at least it had potential to be. I was just on the verge of getting somewhere with my collection of rim worlds when I ran into Galapienzo. I got too greedy, I suppose, wanted to add one more sleeper to the list. I didn't know too much about the place at the time. It had all the right criteria. Out on the rim, fairly isolated, not in the commercial mainstream. I thought it would be easy. Maybe if I'd gotten there about two centuries earlier. Oh, I did business there, good business. But in a place like Galapienzo, good business takes time. I was starting to wonder if this was a pitch at all. The things Davis was saying made sense. I knew what it was like out there at the hard edge on the rim. The thing about doing business in a society like this, you got to be able to work the hierarchies. That takes patience. I had to grease the right palms, get to know the connections and the faces. That led me to other names and faces. Gradually, my network started to grow. Word of mouth is the best sales tool you can get. Am I right? Yeah, don't I know it, I said. That's why we're out here pounding the beat, winning their confidence. Right, Steve, said Davis. Well, Gallipolensins were a cautious lot, always looking for the sting. They drew the process out. I was there maybe two, three months in all. Long enough to work out how the place worked. Long enough to know that the only way I was going to do real business was with the Lord himself. Now, that's only a title, Steve. He's not a deity or anything, though he might as well have been. Sheesh, if you could have seen this guy. I smiled. I'd known a few like him in my time. Anyway, one of the first things I learned about that. Anyway, one of the first things I learned about the Gallipolensans was that they liked to own things. It didn't matter what, but property was status. One way to own things was to dispossess your fellow natives. If they ran out of fellow Gallipolensans, they looked elsewhere. Most of the other worlds didn't like them very much. I didn't like them very much. Arrogant, sneering, opinionated bastards, and that's their good side. It meant they weren't very good at doing business. They couldn't market themselves, you see. That's where I came into the picture. Kezoro, the lord, had a product, but he didn't have anyone to market it for him. He knew he couldn't really rely on his fellow Gallopalensians to go out and have any chance of success. The only way he was going to achieve the status he desired was to own as much as he could of the known worlds. The only way to do that was to take out rights on the basic integrity of a few key individuals, possession by proxy. Suddenly I was confused again. I had no idea what he was talking about, but the man was buying my drink, so I persisted. What do you mean by rights on integrity, Jack? I don't see how that factors in. Davis sipped at his scotch and put down his glass. He ran his fingers through the beaded moisture on its side, then turned and fixed me with a serious expression. Listen, Steve, he said after a long pause, you have every right to ask that question. What place is there for integrity? Say, call it a person's soul. In the hard-nosed reality of these days of FTL travel, it's true. The known universe is no longer what it used to be, and we don't believe in the sort of stuff we used to. Occasionally, I tell people to take the time to browse for a definition of soul. Don't let me stop you, I tell them. I'm sure you'll find the answers. The accumulated knowledge of generations is at your fingertips. Yeah, and? I guess what I'm saying is that I believe in integrity. In other words, I believe in souls, but maybe not in the way others think about them. It's a question of morality. For me, the soul is about having the ability to choose, 
to make your own decisions based upon your own understanding of what's right and wrong. Take away that right from someone, that freedom to choose, and you own his or her soul or whatever you want to call it. It took me a long time to understand that. By the time I realized that, it was too late. Too late for me and too late for a lot of others. I was starting to think I'd run into a religious nut in any moment he was going to come out with some pamphlets, but I was interested now, and the muzzy bourbon effect was softening my tolerance. Okay, Steve, he said, look around. Look at all the worlds out there. Sure, these worlds have elective processes, but behind all that, there's always somebody who ultimately pulls the strings. You think these guys have souls, free will? They might have had once. Have you noticed how most of the big industrialists and people like that have been around a long, long time, the only way they've managed to do that is to lose part of themselves. I know how. I know exactly how they've managed to do it. They've given up the freedom to choose. Someone else calls the shots for them. Now, in my book, if they don't have that freedom, they've lost what we could loosely call their soul. So what are you telling me, Jack? I asked. Is this some sort of religious spiel? You going to save my soul? No, no. Sorry, Steve. He said, here, let me get you another drink. He motioned for the barman. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. The barman filled our glasses and Davis stared down at them, then nodded and waited for the barman's retreat before continuing. He traced a pattern on the bar surface, pursed his lips, and then turned. Let me fill you in on the Galapienzo. It might start to make more sense. I took another sip of my bourbon. Maybe my sixth or seventh, I'd lost count. Galapienzo started small, but as a world, it had all the ingredients to make it something great. It sat isolated on the rim for decades, a backwater overlooked by the trading communities and mainstream commerce around it. The world could have smoldered and sparked, then flared back into non-existence, ignored by the rest of humanity, but Galapienzo had something special. You see, they had their own little scientific community. It interacted with the rest of the research community, but somehow they were on their own. I'd seen worlds like that myself, but I still didn't see where this was going. Well, what Galapalenzo had to keep them apart was unique. The world was home to a tiny molecular structure. Davis held up his thumb and forefinger and peered through the gap between them. That structure became known to the Galapalenza research community, and the beauty of it was that it defied analysis unless you knew how. That was their great discovery, how to analyze the stuff. They weren't going to tell anyone else how to do it. They worked out they had a good thing going as soon as they found out how to apply the little compound. As far as anyone can work out, It's the only means of producing the gene repressor that controls longevity. Think about it. I mean, really think about it. Do you understand the implications? I nodded and licked my lips. So what did they do? They bottled the stuff, of course. Called it Life. A great name, don't you think? Beautiful marketing strategy. I wish I'd thought of it. So they've got this stuff. Why haven't I seen it, I asked. I would have thought it'd be all over the marketplace. You would have thought so, wouldn't you? But it didn't work like that. They had this stuff for, say, about 300 years before it hit the broader byways. Think about it. You have an isolated community, and suddenly it has access to this stuff that prolongs lifespan by a factor of 3, 4, 5. What happens? First, the population expands at an amazing rate. More people, longer lifespan, natural selection steps in. What's a life here or there along the way? People became disposable resources. Hell of an environment to grow up in. For a couple hundred years, that worked admirably. They got on with their business, and we got on with ours. That was until Kezoro clawed his way to the top of the heap. Finally, the Gallipolensians had someone in charge who wasn't satisfied with his own little piece of real estate. The problem was, this guy was not just your run-of-the-mill expansionist head case. He was smart. He had that unusual combination of brains and strength. I told you how they like to own things. Kezoro knew 
Galapalenzo had its limitations. What was it? Some small hick planted out in the sticks. He knew that if some tin pot nation suddenly started going military, he'd have all the combined forces of the known worlds down on him in less time than you could say response force. Whatever else, you have to admire him for his smarts. Davis leaned back and sighed. Personally, I can't stand him. Nasty piece of work. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yes. He had a far better way of conquering civilization. He had the ready-made tool at his fingertips. He had life. The bells of opportunity were ringing faintly in the back of my head, even through the bourbon haze. So what's your involvement? I asked. Davis shrugged. I've been working the Gallipalenza market for some time, and I finally managed to work my way up to Kizoro himself. Oh, he wanted somewhat I had to sell, no trouble there. It was just how he paid me. If only I had the foresight to see what was going on then, he knew exactly what he was doing. After that, I didn't have any choice. What would you have done in my position? There I was, and he was offering me the chance of a lifetime, literally. He paid me for my first consignment in life. By the time we got to the third, I was hooked. It was then that he made me an offer. and How could I refuse? There it was, guaranteed income and my own personal direct supply from the source. He took a deep swallow from his drink. He used me to hook a few of the others in over time. We're all in the same game, after all. We talk, compare notes, swap war stories. It was easy enough to do. I guess in a way we do business despite rather than because of him. We act as our own little support network. Regardless, you got to have faith in the product to do good business. That's how it works. And I've certainly got faith in the product. As for job security, there's nothing to beat it. So why didn't you tell him to stuff his product? Why didn't you just demand payment? He looked at me for a long time before answering. When you get to a certain age, your mortality begins to tell. You felt it, Steve. You start to slow down, feel the strain, become less enthusiastic. You start to think about how long you've got left and what you have left to do. How can you seriously pass up an opportunity like that? You can't. You'd sell your soul for the chance to escape that terminus. Anyone would. And that applies just as much to your leading industrialists and power brokers across the known worlds. You see what I was talking about with souls before? Kezaro knew that, and he knew the power it could give him. Just imagine the prospect of having the means to deny death within the palm of your hand. What would you give to have that power? He knew he had me. I nodded slowly. Davis continued looking at me intently. Remember how I asked you about integrity? Uh Uh-huh. Well, the truth of it is, I never had any intention of compromising my integrity. You have to understand that. When it came to it, I didn't have much choice. Doing business across the multiple worlds can be a hell of a task at the best of times. But with Kezaro calling the shots, it was really difficult. Integrity just didn't come into it. I suppose I could have had a choice, but he owned me by then. What could I do? Davis retrieved his case from the floor, flipped it open, and reached inside. Look at me, he said, without looking at me. How old do you think I am? Forty? Fifty? Well, I'll tell you. Two hundred and six next birthday. I almost dropped my glass. Davis smiled and nodded slowly. Anyway, I've been talking to you for too long. He reached into the case and pulled something out. Here, let me leave you with this. It's just a sample of our new product line. We call it Rejuve. Cute little bottle. See the way it glows? That one's yours to keep. Um, thanks, I said, looking down at the small glass tube lying in my hand. Davis got to his feet. Well, it's been good to meet you, Steve. I'll see you next time I'm through this way, in about eight years. We'll talk some then. You'll be here. He nodded to the barman and walked out. That was eight years ago to the day. Now I'm sitting in that same bar. Maybe if I'd realized what a good pitch it was, things would have been different. But I didn't, and I'm sitting watching the door, hoping that he'll show. There's a half-full glass of bourbon on the bar beside me, and a small, empty bottle in my hand. The End
Discussion questions. Number one. If you were in the narrator's position, would you drink the bottle of Rejuve that was handed to you? Assuming you did drink the bottle of Rejuve and it did work as advertised, would you go back for more of it eight years later? Number three. What would you change about the way you live your life if you knew you were going to live 400 or 500 years? Question four. Does the threat of impending death affect how you live your life? In what way? Does knowing you have a limited amount of time make each day and each choice more precious? Would a nearly unlimited lifespan spoil that preciousness and urgency? And question number five. Kezoro believed that if too many people knew they had discovered life, they would be invaded for their resource. Do you agree? How is this pattern similar or different compared to when a country on Earth discovers it as an abundance of a limited resource, like oil or diamonds? If you enjoyed this story, head over to our companion podcast, After Dinner Conversation Discussions, Episode 52, and listen to our discussion of this and other short stories from our magazine. We will include a link in the description, and of course, you can always continue the discussion on our webpage in the comments section, or on our Facebook page. Have a great day. Next week, listen to Grandma Ruth's Up Truck Stop. Have a great day.